Okay, let's talk about perennials. Perennial flowers, they are, they're, they're prized for their natural beauty. And tonight, Harleen is going to introduce to us some of the more hardier types that require minimal care. So, welcome again, Harleen, to the forum. Great. Well, so is there why include perennials instead of maybe something like annuals? Because yes, of course, annuals you know, probably do have more flower color for you because they put all their energy into their flowers because they know they're going to die and the perennials are going to be there year after year. So if you don't want to plant every year, you know, go with a perennial. You still can go and get color, but you might have to do a little bit more in design so that you have season-long color. When one finishes, another fills in and takes over. And so, and so your, your landscape may change a little bit with that. Um, of course, less mowing and therapeutic. I could probably talk another whole day about all the um, therapeutic aspects of just plants, period. But you can see those right there uh, for benefits. And here are some more um, benefits, especially with youth. You can teach responsibility. And that's what I'm going to do after this. I'm going over to Reed Johnson. And we're going to go and plant up. Um, the dorm guys there are going to go and plant up flowers for their parent, for their mom to take home um, for afterwards. And so I got already small seedlings that are growing because I figured out, out of sight, out of mind, they never, if we planted a seed, they'd probably never water it. So here they'll go and see this plant. It's alive. It's growing. And hopefully they'll take some responsibility. But anyway. <laughs> Open. Um, so what are the essential elements for a low maintenance um, perennials? Or, you know, I'd love a no maintenance perennial, but I don't think there is something like that. So, because um, uh, a, a perennial is going to die back down to the ground, so you're going to have to clean it up in the springtime. I wait till the springtime instead of um, in the fall because I, it's just so much easier to go and clean things for me in the springtime and, and let Mother Nature mat everything together. So, um, so first of all, it has to be hardy enough for your zone, and we've talked about that. Um, and the ones I have tonight are hardy for all of North Dakota. Um, they need to tolerate local summer conditions without supplemental care. So what that means is, you know, if we have a little bit of a drought, they're not just going to die on you. Uh, they don't require any special soil type, um, and if they do better in a certain, you know, as far as um, moisture, you know, some will do much better in a more moist condition. So they're put, you know, as far as shade because they have more of a requirement for moist soil, so you, they grow well in the shade. Light requirements are appropriate for the location. So sometimes it's putting the plant in the correct location um, that makes it low maintenance. Uh, because if you don't put them in the right location, you're going to have to do a lot of work to go and make them look OK. Some other things that you might want to have is that they're long lived. I mean, if, if they only last two years, that's not going to save you that much time over an annual. Um, so, and also infrequent um, division. A lot of times we don't divide enough and we could really rejuvenate these perennials if we go on a three to five year um, division. I know my neighbors really, you know, they're like, you know, they see me in the summer out digging, they're going, oh no, here she comes again, she's going to be bringing us a bunch of hostas or something like that or day lilies. Um, because my day lilies, I mean, they get so big, and if you don't go and rejuvenate that, um, they're going to start to go downhill, or they're not going to flower as much, and, and so you just need to go and do some division on those. But generally, other care, 
you don't, you shouldn't have to state them. Uh, you shouldn't have to go and DH means deadheading. I mean, who has the time to do that? Not me. So um, if if they're going to look ugly with that bloom after it's done, it's not for me considered a low maintenance uh, plant because I shouldn't have to go out there and deadhead. Withstand summer heat, occasional droughts, slow growing, a long bloom period would be good. And, and so, but even if they did have that um, long bloom period, they got to have some attractiveness to um, the leaves. And I'll have a few examples of, you know, uh, of some plants that really don't have the longest bloom period, but, you know, they have an attractive leaf. Or maybe that's the only thing they really have going for them is that. So we're going to get into the spring ones. And, you know, Jack in the Pulpit may not be on everyone's list because, uh, first of all, it does kind of need that moist soil. But I have a nice area. And, okay, I, I should set these up first. Uh, the PS means part shade and or shade. You'll see a, or if you're, you know, I, it's the pessimist versus the optimist. If you're the optimist, it needs part sun. If you're the pessimist, it's part shade. And so, and then you might see an FS, which is full sun. So this is just the light requirement, and then the flowering in the zone hardiness, and then your general height. And a lot of times, if they're going to be um, one to two foot tall, they generally get about one to two foot wide. Uh, some of them may be a little bit more columnar than others, but um, Jack in the Pulpit, uh, it really it has a spat that is considered a flower, and that then changes into this uh, red um, fruit cluster, I guess. Um, and so here you see it coming out of the ground in the spring, um, the, that um, typical leaf, and your staff, and then that changes with time into these little, this cluster of red berries. And really, you see these growing a lot in, in shade. And now I have some on, the, like I said, on the north side, and they just kind of come up amongst some of my other stuff, and they're just kind of there. Um, I never do anything to them. <laughs> and so low maintenance that way is for sure. Blue Star. Um, flower is another one I kind of I, I like because I mean when it's flowering you, you see a lot of flowers um, and you really it doesn't have any kind of pest problem you can see it, it tolerates drought um, and it, it probably is best in moist soil but I've seen it in just I mean we have one on the um, east side of Lofsgard out in full sun and it uh, it does fine, and they don't do any watering around on that area, and it's just looking <coughs> great. And so, where I have less flowers under part sun, you might not see as many flowers, but pretty easy to care. Get that name because the flowers do look like a star. And here's some of those, some cultivars that you might find in the available. So, wild ginger, uh, Canadian wild ginger. There's also a European wild ginger. And really, if you need something as a ground cover, I think these work quite well. Uh, really doesn't have anything for a flower. Makes, though, a good, thick ground cover. And something that gets that nice and thick as a ground cover, you don't have to worry about pulling weeds in between. And, and so, does quite well as a ground cover. And and hardy. So there it's coming up in the spring and you can see that little flower, um, very small, and then it, you know, disappears and leaves open up more and, and you don't even see it. Close up of that flower. Not too attractive. So this is more for those heart shaped leaves that just, you know, really do a wonderful job of, of making a ground cover and filling in an area. Now, a lot of these that you're going to see are, are, are really native uh, 
prairie plant, forbs. Um, and so um, false indigo is one of those. And you know, it gets rather tall, but it's one of those plants that you can just, you got a spot for it. You're going to have to have a rather large spot for it, because you can see three to four foot tall, three to four foot wide, but it'll be as content as can be, and it doesn't spread. And the worst thing about, you know, some of these perennials is they, they become the Hitlers of the world. They want to take over that spot, and that spot, and that spot, and just keep on going. Um, false indigo, just happy, cool uh, pea-like flower um, that then have, becomes a uh, seed capsule that is used a lot of times. You'll see it used in um, dried arrangements. Uh, the leaves, the flower, you can see a little bit there. Uh, it was 2010 perennial plant of the year. Uh, you can just see some of the clusters there. Um, there's the seed capsules. Uh, and then in the fall, um, the dried ones. So now, bleeding hearts. So fringe bleeding heart is much better than any um, other, uh, you know, your common bleeding heart because your common bleeding heart, if you get any kind of little fluctuation in your soil moisture, it'll just go dormant on you. And then you have, you know, your common bleeding heart so much bigger, so you got this big gap in the middle of summer. What well, was there? You know, oh, that's my um, common bleeding heart. You don't have to worry about that with the fringe bleeding heart. And so, much more petite, smaller, and it doesn't go dormant when you have any kind of a little drought come. And so, um, there's also um, the western bleeding heart. I don't know anyone who can really tell them apart unless some botanist really wants to. But the western bleeding heart, you'll, you'll see a little bit different colors. Oops. Now, here, the Siberian iris, this is one of those things that is, you know, they don't flower a long time, but then when they're done, they're very easy to clean up. I mean, you don't have to do anything. I got this clump in this area that gets a little bit more moist. And so I've gone through a number of other perennials. Boom, this one's just happy there. Um, if we get those rains and water collects, it takes it, it doesn't die. And they've got the flowers. Then you have these sword-like leaves. And so that's what I think is really nice about, about this. And you get all different kinds of colors. And there's like a thousand different um, cultivars <laughs> of that. Uh, last for the spring flowers would then would be uh, South Dakota state flower, the past flower, comes up very early in the spring and flowers. Um, again, then as it, uh, when it's done, its seed capsule is kind of like your uh, clematis, a little wispy. And I hopefully, you know, maybe I don't have an example of that, but you can see how early, um, this gives you some color really, really early. And there's the seed capsule um, up in the corner there. And so, so moving on, if there's one yarrow that I think has merit, it would be the fern leaf yarrow because, again, only bad thing, it only comes in yellow. <laughs> um, but unlike the other uh, yarrow, um, no soil, um, which creeps all over. This is very content. So, you know, it'll stay into this clump. It won't take over. Uh, there's been some on campus probably for 20 years, same clump. You know, maybe it's a little bit bigger, but it isn't um, trying to go all over the place. You see deer and rabbit resistant. Hey, really good. Um, so, but it's yellow. Pretty yellow, though. Bright yellow. Uh, ladies' mantle, another one that, uh, you know, I think ladies' mantle is more for the leaves. You get these um, fuzzy leaves that uh, you can see on this picture, how they're holding on those little beads of water because of all the little hairs on the leaf. Um, I don't think so much of the, the flower cluster, but um, the, the flowers actually are long-lived, and I've seen them used. They'll put them into little vases, and they last for a long time. And so there, you see that close-up of the, of the leaf. And that's really, I think, what is great about this plant. 
I have had it go and actually seed occasionally, but usually you don't have it self-seeding. Prairie grasses, of course, um, prairie grasses are all going to um, be low maintenance in, in which basically you just let them grow in the springtime. They'll go and chop off um, down to, you know, give about four to six inches and remove the rest above and it'll go and sprout out. And so big blue stem is one of those. Another rather tall plant is goat's beard. And, you know, this one, well, this one's kind of marginal as far as, you know, you kind of have to work a little bit more with it if you want to go and, and keep it um, from getting some leaf margin burn. And so, but uh, it has male and female flowers. And you can see the one up on the above. That's male flowers, that's showier. They've got to strut their stuff better than the, the female flowers. Another grass, now this one, I, if you don't see this one on every block in, in the neighborhood, um, you know, then they're not into grasses too much because feather reed grass is probably the most common or, ornamental grass I've ever seen. Um, because, uh, especially the Carl Forrester, it's gorgeous and it's so, uh, it just has, it's so carefree, easy to take care of. Um, and has an attractive um, flower or seed head to it. There's the Carl Forrester. Flowers a little bit two weeks earlier. Uh, it's a little bit shorter, so works into a lot more of your uh, landscape. And it has then, as it ripens, you get that nice uh, yellowish gold color. There are some variegated ones. They probably they aren't near as hardy. Anytime you get variegation into a species, you give up something. And a lot of times it's winter hardiness. So with a lot of these, if you see variegated, think about it's not going to be as hardy. Of course, here's another uh, native forb, a uh, prairie forb, um, butterfly weed, in which it's a, it's a milkweed and has those orange flowers. They're working a little bit more with the breeding to get some other colors. Um, it, and but you know as far as uh, the monarch butterfly loves uh, the milkweed and so um, one of those and very slow growing never have to worry about it doesn't transplant though so don't try to transplant it after you've gotten it established it just doesn't do well um, you know I'm going to skip over I love to say Sima Safuga but um, black snake root. Um, because it really does require a lot of, um, it's best in, in moist soil, and if you don't have moist soil, you don't do a lot of mulching to keep it moist, you're going to see a lot of leaf margin burn, and it's not going to look so attractive. But otherwise, you wouldn't have to do much with it, and now they have a lot of these purples that are really attractive. Um, so, of course, Another prairie forb, echinacea, purple coneflower, um, probably ha is seen in everyone's uh, uh, ornamental planting. Um, but, you know, recently they've come out with a lot of these uh, double flowers and like that. You have the white, and the pink is, you know, your typical one. Uh, you get something like that razzmatazz. Uh, but they've also come out with other colors. Now, a lot of these aren't as hardy either, so you have to be careful with that. Another grass, a blue fescue. Now, I cut off the seed heads because you just like those little narrow bluish green, whitish blue um, uh, leaves that you see there. So, hostas, of course, you know, you got a good spot for, you got shade. Hostas are great. They come all kinds of variegated colors, so not that you need this flower that you see here. Um, the Plantagenet is supposed to be the, the fragrant one with the flowers, but um, they don't have as uh, much color, variegation in colors as some of these other ones. You get the wavy leaf, um, hostas, and like that. The blue ones, you know, they got that giant one that goes about five foot and has leaves like, you know, something else. Of course, um, 
peonies, hybrid peonies, um, very traditional, been around for a long time. I don't think I need to go and, and I think everyone knows, well, they're pretty darn hard to even kill if you're trying to kill them. My mom's neighbor, every summer, she, you know, after they were done flowering, she'd mow them down. And just weekly, mow them down. And 30 some years later, they were still there. They weren't flourishing, but they were still there. So, uh, pretty amazing. Now, um, the, the doubles aren't as clean as the singles. The singles you don't have to worry about doing anything with. But when you have the doubles for the flowers and then you get a rain, that's when it gets a little ugly. So if you really want low maintenance, go with the singles. I think they're gorgeous, that huge cup, you know, but everyone's like, ooh, we get all the extra petals with the doubles. Salvia, please, these last few years, salvia, perennial salvia has just been amazing. You're driving along and you see this just purple just jump out at you. And sure enough, it's perennial salvia. I don't know what happened these last two summers, but it's just been gorgeous. Um, the most robust purple and, uh, um, again, very easy to take care of, low maintenance type of a, a plant. I, I really like salvia, perennial salvia. Not a lot of different colors, though. Okay, just three more, I think. Um, Blazing Star, um, unique. Again, a prairie forb, but most of your flowers will go and they'll send up this flower stalk, and from the bottom, they'll keep elongating, and you, so your most mature flower is at the bottom, and your least mature one is at the top. Liatris, or uh, Gay Feather, Blazing Star, just the opposite. It starts from the top down. And so that and Ligularia, I think, are the only two that do this um, that I can remember. So, but there's a, uh, a lot of different species, but, you know, I see these used, you know, the flower lasts a really long time. I see them even used for cut flowers um, and some of the different colors, but usually you'll see that in the purple. And there's a whole bunch of different uh, forbs and species that have just different in, in their flowering characteristics. Sedum, or showy sedum, um, again, this is one of those things that if you can't grow a, a sedum, don't try anything. I mean, <laughs> it's just, uh, and, and you know, now you can get some of those that, like the the purple one, that tends to get over um, too bushy and then it kind of flattens out. But a lot of these, you, you know, I mean, if you divide every three to five years, you shouldn't have any problem with them starting to lose their mound and, and split open. But, I mean, if the dog runs through and knocks off a few stems, Stick them in the ground, they'll rut, and you'll have more plants. Uh, they're just so easy to take care of. Um, the only bad thing is they flower really late, and so you get that freeze, and I got three days of nice color, and then that was it. You know, <laughs> so that's the worst part about um, showy sedum. So, and they have some variegated ones, but you know, all, all the ones with the variegated leaves have such a pale, ugly flower that it's like, oh, geez, you know, uh, so, um, but I really like the, well, Indian Chief, I like it because it's a deeper red. Um, I, I don't like the, the bluish green leaves and then something like Starburst, the white, it's just I don't see the kind of contrast with that, some of these other ones. So. Not too bad. Not too bad. Okay, you trained. Okay, let's get it going though. Okay, first of all, question. Do you have a recommendation for a perennial that would do well in a moist area? Well, uh, low spot. Low spot. How about a low spot? You can go raspberries, you can go raspberries on it. So wet. Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I do think. Uh, yeah, there'd be a number of irises that would do really, really well. <laughs> and so you can get into your Japanese irises, your yellow iris, they actually plant them right along the margin or in the, in the water. So, 
Um, so irises, I think, would be not your bearded irises. Really, you know, I wouldn't go with a bearded iris. But how about uh, do you have a professional opinion about lily of the valley? Besides that, my calorie and moist area. Uh, be careful! It will take over the world. I started with a club like this. Now it has. It's bigger than that table, and I keep digging it up, and and I think that I'm just spreading it more, and so. Well, I didn't know that was a bad thing. It's good to see something spread here in North Dakota. How about uh, how about a, when's the best time to divide a peony, spring or fall? Or do you have some general recommendations? We get this question a lot about when should you divide a perennial. I like to go and do it in the springtime because then you're, you're not taxing, okay, did I get it established and then it goes into winter. Um, so I wait and do it in the spring so I know I, you know, I don't have to worry about it trying to survive the winter and that, you know, did I do it early enough or, you know. So I like to do it in the springtime. I know what I'm working with. Um, and. You know, like my hostas, they start to have their little cones poking up, good time to go and divide it. Um, then I don't have to, you know, when you do it in the fall, you got leaves and then you're doing, you're damaging leaves, you're damaging a lot of roots, you got transpiration, um, and so you're losing moisture and you may not have enough of a root system there, and so you're really stressing it, and then it goes into winter. You, you do it in the springtime, you avoid those kind of things. Okay, thank you. How about, as a general rule, never divide a perennial when it's blooming? Can you deal with thinking about that? Well, why would you want to divide it? Because I don't know anyone who could go and divide something and not make a mess of things. At least I, you know, if I try to divide something when it's flowering, I break off this stalk and that stalk, and so um, enjoy the flowers while you can. Okay, uh, how about What's the best way to tell the difference between salvia and lavender? Well, lavender is not going to, um, uh, isn't going to last very long. It's the smell, yeah, different. And um, salvia just has that crinkly leaf on it that I don't see necessarily. You know, what's the difference between salvia and lavender? Oh, Veronica. Okay. So the question was, what is the difference between salvia and Veronica? Now, those might look a little bit more similar, um, but Veronica stays, um, well, a lot of them stay smaller and send up a single spike. And, and so salvia, again, Veronica doesn't have that kind of a crinkly bubble leaf on it. And, uh, but Veronica, yeah, spicata, it stays small. Then you have some other Veronica's like um, blue, blue something, and those are hybrids, and so they'll get a little bit taller. But you know, they different flower. They have more of a, a cone type flower, and and um, your salvia is more of a spike. Okay, thank you. And we're going to have to cut the questions now. Uh, we, I know there's some more questions to be asked, but we do we want to stay on schedule as best as we can, and we will do our best to address these extra questions during our overtime session at eight thir approximately 8:30 tonight. So let's thank Arlene for the perennial presentation. Thank you, Arlene. <laughs>